Hello, Miss Jody coming to you again um, for the history of medicine for our second video. Uh, as a review from our first video, don't forget to be taking your notes on little half sheets of paper and like such that will be glued right here where the notes would have been um, underneath the label. And don't forget to write on the back of the page the label, like chicken collar or whatever, so we can keep track of what sheet gets glued underneath which label. So last time that I made a video for you, we were talking about Louis Pasteur again, and we finished up with his great um, life contribution to science and our medical understanding, and we were able to see him tackle many things that were a big problem um, back in the day that can still be a problem in, in countries that aren't as supported as ours um, in the medical um, uh, context. So, but Louis Pasteur, he went after um, understanding why the chickens were getting sick with the chicken cholera. He went after anthrax. You remember rabies was one of his big concerns and trying to help with that particular problem. So we studied a lot about his success in figuring these things out and we're grateful for his um, dedication in those areas and to be able to see the progress um, and the fight against these very problematic uh, diseases like cholera and what was seen with the anthrax, okay? And of course the rabies. All right, I'm gonna leave two pages because if we do get to come back together, I thought we'd do some kind of craft or activity that went along with um, the uh, chicken cholera, the anthrax. Of course, we're not gonna be messing around with no anthrax or, or the um, particular microbe that causes the chicken cholera, but um, we love working with growing all kinds of bacteria and all that, I love that. So, um, and then I left a spot for a picture in case we do get to come back together and do something like that. Now moving on, and this is our third guy, or third chapter, and I try to do the test in chap three sets of, or sets of three. So um, this, the three would be Robert Koch, um, Louis Pasteur again, and then Dr. Lind here, James Lind that we're gonna discuss, that we're gonna study, and then I'll put a chapter test in that. All right, so uh, Dr. Lind. So the topic of the chapter is Dr. Lind's limes. And so at first you might think, oh, this is gonna be about Lyme's disease, which we definitely wanted to study in health, um, but this is actually gonna be about scurvy. Now, um, back in the day, scurvy was a big problem, and we don't experience a lot of this in America uh, to the extent that they used to experience it because we have a lot more understanding now um, that it ended up being a nutritional, uh, lack of nutritional um, components, that type of uh, disease. So in 1535, Jacques Cartier, he was a French navigator. This is just as the storyline opens up, just to get an introduction of what it was like back in the days when scurvy was was um, a big, such a big problem. Uh, he was a French navigator and he, and he anchored his ships in St. Lawrence um, or near the St. Lawrence River, which is in now um, Montreal, Canada, as where they, well, that's where they ended up staying. And um, they spent, him and his uh, men spent the winter there. So if you can, if you have a map, you can kind of see where that is. Um, Montreal, Canada is actually where they stayed, but this St. Lawrence River was the, the anchoring. Okay, um, so in his group, more than 100 men um, in the expedition had come down with scurvy. Now scurvy was called it because that means scaly skin. Because what would happen is really because of this lack of the vitamin C, um, the people would lose weight, they would grow weak, the connective tissue fibers would weaken because basically you need that vitamin C for your connective tissue and we know what that means studying human anatomy and physiology, um, the connective tissue world. And you need that for the strong connective tissue. Um, gums would bleed, sores wouldn't heal, their teeth would loosen out. And so it was described as, as, as if they would die as if they had come apart. So you can imagine a weak, limp, um, uh, falling apart of the body because the connective tissue and, and studying connective tissue, we un totally can understand that, right? Because of how important that connective tissue is to keeping all of these different parts uh, where they need to be. So um, it is said that in during this time when he stayed there and his men had come down, that the natives living there had offered a homemade remedy um, of drinking a tea of pine needles soaked in water. So pine needles, not knowing this at the time, but had the, had the 
vitamin C component in it. But so they soaked these um, pine, ne pine needles and made a concoction and drank it and the men survived. And so they were like, wow, this is great, but not really understanding the correlation. At this time, scurvy was still thought of as a contagious disease, uh, pathogenic side of um, just not understanding what that was. And and it really hadn't been, um, the germ theory of disease hadn't been fully accepted at this time. Well, definitely not back in, here, um, but then eventually it gets accepted. So they didn't understand it all, but they just thought you could catch it. So a hundred years passed after this particular expedition, it says, and the scurvy remained the scourge of sailing ships. And so the hard problem was um, that they, back then, especially the British um, Empire, uh, was relying on the boats because the boats were part of their... Um, uh, protecting their nation and keeping the people from coming in from the water and then also for their their goods transporting their goods and their commerce and so it was hard because in the 1700s more sailors on british ships died of scurvy than of all other diseases naval battles and shipwrecks combined so this was a problem and imagine being someone who is to work on the boats imagine your fear when you are going to be risking your life because it just happened to be a lot of the people that were dealing with the boats were getting this now there were other people getting this problem and it's dr james lynn who kind of starts to to correlate that it wasn't just those on the ship, but that's what you noticed a lot because um, these men on the ships were getting it. All right, so the British Empire, like I said, they depended on the ships for the commerce and the national security. So this problem had to be solved. Um, and that would be the introduction, that first page that you would note Dr. Lynn's limes. And then the second page of our notes um, is gonna tell us the storyline of Lynn's uh, brilliance and trying to figure this out and just like we'll see with like we've already seen with all of these gentlemen involved in the history of medicine and women um their ideas at first are so uh blocked and mocked and so they have to persevere and push through with new ideas because they believe so whole wholeheartedly in the data that's collected and they know there's a correlation they can't just sometimes can't all the way prove it. And so um, many people have given their lives to furthering these types of things because they just won't give up and they will push forward. And um, they many of them will refer to it like as a calling because they can just sense they have to like um, solve this. And we saw Louis Pasteur was like that, Koch. I mean, they many scientists just have to figure these things out and think... The Lord for that because then we have our furtherance in our, our uh, medical understanding. So uh, James Lind was a Scottish physician. He began his medical career as, as a surgeon's mate in the British Royal Navy. So helping out in that area. So he's already very familiar with the, the Navy side of things. Uh, very perplexed by what he would see in this in this area of scurvy. Um, in 1747 it says he began to treat patients or he began treating patients at the Naval Hospital in Edinburgh. And so as obviously a naval hospital, you're going to see a lot of this problem. And he was shocked by the number of cases and, dis and disturbed by no cure and like no correlation. Like what is happening? What is this that's happening? And, and it's hard because when you're, when you're talking about something like a plague or like a, con um, a contagious situation like we have now with the COVID-19, um, and you see all these people being, um, sickened by it and all that you start to put the patterns together okay older people people with respiratory um, distress people with um, autoimmune just you know you start to put these patterns together in um, the epidemiology of trying to figure out you know where did it come from who does it affect so the epidemiology and the pathology of the particular disease so the epidemiology of the virus and then the the pathology like what path it took to to do the harm to the body and so as a doctor, he is so disturbed by not being able to figure this out. So um, he realized after he did a lot of research and data and read other people's stuff that it showed up not only on the ships, but also in remote villages during long winters. And that was a clue there. And on mountain climbing expeditions is, is foraging to new areas. Um, so this is a clue. Winter, it happened a lot when the men were on their boats in the winter time and they were um, separated from... Now we know the nutritional substances they need. 
Um, so, uh, ships often voyage a year or more with a lack of a way to keep food from spoiling. So what they would do is they dried it and preserved it with salts and all that. And a way to store fresh fruits and vegetables was really, really difficult. Um, so they ate a lot of what they call, um, hardtack biscuits. And I just think of them like the really thick biscuits that you make from just plain old flour and water and salt. And it just seems like, ugh, like you're just eating clay. And um, a lot of salt pork because the meat had to be um, salted to be preserved. So when I think of that, uh, you know, biscuits, I mean, sadly, I think of um, the bacon, egg, cheese biscuit of McDonald's. Like, I like it and stuff. But when I eat too much of that biscuit... Like, I can't even eat both sides of it. It's just, like, too much. And now, especially with this lesson, I'm like, ugh, can't order no hardtack from McDonald's and a little salt pork, you know, and who else knows what's in that food, right? <laughs> so um, I can just imagine, because when I go on vacation or something like that, I eat out too much and eat too much uh, fast food, I just feel, like, heavy in my stomach and just, like, Ugh, all I want is fruits and vegetables. Like I crave it because it's just, it's light and it's, it's, you know, your body starts to want to need it. So imagine a whole year eating this stuff. And so as he began to uh, try to put this correlation together, 10 years, uh, he struggled with trying to solve the problem. And the research pointed toward the lack of uh, certain fresh foods, especially the fruits and vegetables. Now imagine his surprise when, um, he started to try to put together a, a way of studying this. Some people give him the credit as this is the first clinical trials um, for trying to, to figure out this uh, the pathology of this. And some don't say that he doesn't deserve that credit, but I think it's kind of cool. You know, he put together an experiment and that's what we have to do in the science world. We come up with our ideas, but what does what do our experiments show us? So he took 12 sailors and he put them into pairs of six. I'm sorry in six pairs, okay? And he kept the main diet, and these were men who were dealing with the scurvy, and he kept their main diet the same, uh, but then he varied what they ate just a little bit. So some he gave cider, some he gave spices, and specifically it brings out um, to a pair that he gave two oranges and one lemon every day. And that seemed to be the, the, um, the mixture that kind of started to create a better health for the that particular pair. And so he knew he was on to something. And now there's a lot of notes. And again, I've talked about this before. You can give me your notes down. Um, I took three pages for this uh, or about two and a half, but you might only end up having two pages. But again, just never write on the back of a sheet because I'm going to have to glue them right in there. So make sure you could do page one, page two, or continue writing it um, with the title from the label, however you want to do it. Okay. So, um, so as time went on, he started to think that this was a nutritional uh, problem. And so there is a storyline of a very famous captain, Captain James Cook, one of England's greatest captains. And he had dreamed of going on a very long expedition, wanting to explore the entire Pacific, the size and scope of it. And it was estimated to take four years. His problem was he knew that in four years time, he was going to have a lot of trouble with his men and not wanting this scurvy to be the, um, the downside of an expedition of that size, he went to Dr. Lin for help. And this was Dr. Lin's advice. So not only was it the fresh fruits and vegetables, but also teaching them to have a more um, cleanly, cleanly lifestyle and to have medical help above board, I mean, um, help aboard and fresh drinking water. And then also having a wide selection of different types of foods stocked, not just a, a um, the the biscuit and the pork, uh, salted pork, but to have a variety, whatever they could, and especially citrus fruits, oranges, lemons, and limes. And of course, limes kept the best. And so I think that's one of the reasons why um, it becomes such a, uh, what's the word, a visual for this particular scurvy is the limes because they didn't um, rot as fast. And he also said, I need you to make landfall as much as possible and to replenish your fresh foods because he really thought this was a correlation. And of course, the um, 
the uh, captain had a lot of respect for him and followed his advice, and he had a great successful journey. He outlined Australia, sailed around New Zealand, um, went to the Arctic Circle, and it did end up taking the four-year span. And so he was very success successful in keeping his men healthy. Um, with this type of news, however, the British... Um, the ones who were in charge of the Navy, um, the um, Admiralty, they were not happy with the suggestion, now with the successful situation, that it might have been them all along uh, harming the their sailors. And so they refused to believe it. And it reminds me of the time when we talked about Samoese, when he was, uh, Samoese, when he was trying to tell the, the surgeons, it's you, the stuff is on your hands, you're getting this onto the people, or to the women, and in transferring this to them for the childbed fever. And they were appalled at the idea, well, you're trying to say we, who are of great um, authority and position in life, are the ones who are actually harming the patients? And so that was one of their reasons for pushing back on his particular idea of where the childbed fever was coming from. And so this reminds me a lot of it. And again, like I said, when it comes to the history of medicine, it does take dedicated people to push past the opposition of those who do not want to look into other options and other things. Um, so uh, they weren't happy about this. And so they kind of basically said, nope, it's not true. 10 years passed and Dr. Lin's success grew as he continued in his um life as a physician and he became a physician to King George II. And so the more that he became well known and accredited, uh, people began to think that maybe his ideas were possibly correct. Um, in 1795, finally the um, admiralty, the, those in charge of the naval um, teams, finally gave in to the process that he had suggested about the cleanliness. They had already given in a little bit about the clean, living quarters and having medical help aboard and drinking water and selection of food. They just, they just couldn't bring themselves into believing that they just needed to have, um, some, some citrus fruits and vegetables that it was, that was too simple for them to think that this terrible disease that was killing people was the lack of something as simple as that. Um, so it took them a while, but then they eventually, um, gave way to that and they ordered sailors to drink lime juice. Um, and of course, because the limes didn't decay as much, that was the famous one. And then, so nowadays you call some, you've heard someone call the British sailors the limeys, and that's linked back to the time with the um, limes. And so it becomes something. Now, the problem with this uh, is that vitamin C uh, can be very fragile. And so we'll talk a little bit about why sometimes it doesn't always work out the way that it you would think, especially if you remove the citrus and try to create like a, a room temperature version of it um, in concentrate, it doesn't have the same effect. Okay, but more than a century passed before doctors learned that scurvy is actually truly a dietary deficiency disease. It's actually what it is, and it's caused by a lack of the vitamin C. And vitamin C is very, very, very important, and in fact, very much so underrated for the importance of vitamin C. And I I really have a passion for vitamin C, and I'd love to attach a video for you that would give you some understanding on the vitamin C and its benefits more than what we normally think of, and um, just to give us a better feeling of that vitamin C. Now, sometimes the vitamin C is controversial because some doctors say, no, you can't. All you're doing is um, if you have more vitamin C, you're just pretty much making an expensive urine and your body's going to flush it. And then there's other doctors that say, no, hey, look in these high doses, just this is what happens and these different types of healing properties. Um, but I guess you're going to have to decide that on your own and do your own research on that with the vitamin C to see what you think. Um, but in this particular case, we do know that it definitely fought against the scurvy. Now, the problem with vitamin C, 
um, when they were on their ships and back in the day there was no refrigeration for food um, and so what they would do is they'd smoke food salt food and dry it right well in this process it was destroying the vitamin C but even in just the process of exposure to light vitamin C does not maintain the same uh, way that we need it um, in even that aspect so that's why sometimes we see with vitamin C or like orange juices they're in a cardboard container um, that you drink or that it's poured out of to have the limited um, light to it and then it's it's remain refrigerated that's because in with the room temperature that also changes the vitamin C so it's kind of complex um, but it's important for us I think more so to get our vitamin C from sources that are like peel the cutie and eat it or the orange or whatever uh, um, a lot of scientists say kiwi is just fantastic parsnip um, there's a whole bunch of them that are just wonderful for vitamin C okay so just I mean, naturally. Uh, so despite Dr. Lin's victory over scurvy, most doctors of the 1800s still refused to believe it was that easy. And so here was the, the solving, and yet they still, um, they thought it was contagious. They didn't understand. And then after Pasteur and Koch proved the germ theory of disease, and it started to take... Um, uh, its stand, it was even harder to get the doctors to look to the diet um, to cure some diseases because then once they realized germs, what you know, the category, the germ category, any microorganism that's leading towards sickness or health, then that became the culprit for everything. It's germs, it's germs. And of course, we've seen that happen because then we totally went the opposite way and purelled our whole life and our whole being um, because we're so afraid of germs, but then we realized oh no, we're killing off the good microbes. And so germs became a problem for even dietary um, diseases, uh, diet diseases, because then people didn't, they thought it had to be something worse than that. So we do know that there's a lot of links to a good healthy diet. Not that any of us follow what we should be doing, including myself. Um, but the more knowledge that we gain in understanding this, the better off I think we are going to be. Now, um, with this and not being able to do any of our um, science experiments or whatever, I thought we could do maybe a little art with this one because I found a good little um, art video on making um, a drawing and painting uh, uh, limes and I thought that'd be kind of cool so I'm gonna be sending you a video um, for doing some lime painting and don't forget to do it on a half sheet so I can put it in your journal and be as creative as you want and pick whichever ones you want of the ones that I send you and that way we can just do something fun together if you have some watercolors at home and I think one of the videos just does it with colored pencils or markers so do whatever you want but I thought that would be pretty creative for us to to work on so we'd have something, okay? All right, well, I'll miss you guys, and I'll talk to you soon.